remember that virtue is going to be a mean between extremes. So how are we gonna find that mean? Aristotle's general answer is we'll find the mean by using practical wisdom. We'll talk about how practical wisdom plays out in each of the specific virtues we talk about. But Aristotle has a couple of general pieces of advice on finding the mean. These come close to the end of book two, uh, in book two, chapter nine, to be precise. And we have to assume that these recommendations are coming from Aristotle's own practical wisdom, from his own experience and what he's learned from it. The first suggestion is that we look at ourselves, each of us look at himself or herself and observe what our own tendencies are. And this is part of the mean being relative to us. If you remember part five of the definition of virtue, if I know that I have a tendency toward a certain extreme, then to find the mean, it will help me to push myself in the other direction. Let's consider an example. If you know that you have a tendency toward being a workaholic, then finding the mean for you means that you'll push yourself in the direction of working less. But if you tend to be a couch potato, you need to push yourself in the other direction in order to find the mean. Sometimes this business of finding the mean really is about accurate self-observation on the part of the individual. And we'll see several examples of this in relation to particular virtues, especially the virtue related to anger, which Aristotle calls mildness. Becoming virtuous always involves pushing ourselves to avoid the extremes we ourselves tend toward. Aristotle's own image for this is to say that each of us is warped wood. Each of us is warped in a certain direction and we need to pay attention to that warp. If someone is stingy, for instance, they need to push themselves toward giving too much. They're not very much at risk of going to the other extreme because they're so far from it. One more example, if you tend to be a perfectionist, you need to push yourself toward letting your work have a few flaws, that it would take an unjustifiably large amount of time and effort to make perfect. But if you tend to be a little sloppy or careless in your work, then you'll get closer to the mean if you push yourself to make more corrections. You, you are at very little risk of perfectionism because you're so far from it. So we can't give general advice in these cases. It will depend upon the individual, what they need to do to reach the mean between extremes, that virtuous, not quite mathematical midpoint. It's always going to be hard work. If something is bent in a particular direction, it takes effort to bend it back. There's one general piece of advice that Aristotle does offer us. We are all biased in favor of pleasure. So pushing ourselves to avoid pleasure will essentially always take us toward the mean between extremes. Very few people are at risk of not liking pleasure enough. All of us are at risk of being too influenced by pleasure. So going against pleasure will almost always move us in the right direction. But we do have to be careful here in the spirit of Mill's higher lower pleasure distinction. Obviously, pleasure in knowing the truth about things is not bad. We would wanna cultivate a pleasure like that. So Aristotle must mean primarily physical pleasure here that we should avoid. Virtue is a state that decides, or a better translation, a habit of deciding. And Aristotle focuses now on decision or choice. Obviously, we're not going to hold someone responsible for something that they themselves did not choose. In order for us to say that an action is right or wrong, it has to be voluntary. And if we're physically forced to do something, no one blames us for it. Aristotle gives two examples here, wind and kidnapping. If a strong wind comes along, 
and blows me into you and your arm gets broken. I'm not to blame, it was the wind. Or if you're supposed to meet your friend at a protest and you get kidnapped or arrested for that matter, your friend is not going to blame you for not showing up. So Aristotle calls things we do because we were physically forced to do them involuntary. And therefore, virtue is not about these kinds of actions at all. We don't blame someone for these actions if they're bad. We also would not praise someone for something if the action is good. So if the wind, for example, instead of breaking your arm, uh, let's say before the wind incident, your shoulder was dislocated and me running into you popped your shoulder back into place, you're not going to thank me for it and tell your friends what a good person I am. This is the sort of thing that Aristotle means by saying that such actions are not subject to praise or blame because we are not the ones who chose them. And there's a second cause for an action to be voluntary. That's ignorance. If I open a door into someone and someone else is on the other side and gets injured, I'm not blamed because I didn't know someone else was there. But there are exceptions. One exception is when I could have known and should have known. So in LMU's St. Rob's classroom, the doors have little windows in them. You can see if someone is standing right up against one of them before you open it. So if you didn't bother to look through it, we blame you for your ignorance. It's blameworthy ignorance or what philosophers refer to as culpable ignorance, which is from mea culpa, which you say if you're a Catholic and are confessing sin. The other exception, which is classic Aristotle, if someone hurts you without meaning to, but then doesn't regret it, or is even happy that they harmed you, Aristotle says we blame them anyway, even though the action was involuntary, not because they chose the wrong thing, but because their lack of regret is a sign of bad character. There are times when we consider calling something involuntary because it's similar to a case of physical force, but it's actually psychological force that's in play. Aristotle's two examples in the passage right after the one we just looked at are a hostage situation and a ship in a storm. In the hostage situation, a tyrant, Aristotle's word for a dictator, you can think of Kim Jong-un, takes your parents and your children hostage and forces you to do something shameful, something like the very first episode in Netflix's Black Mirror, where the British prime minister is forced to have sex with a pig on live television in order to have hostage takers release a member of the royal family. I hope you appreciate the vivid example because it's going to help you remember Aristotle's point here. It seems like the prime minister was forced to have sex with the pig, but Aristotle wants to resist calling the action involuntary because the prime minister did have a choice. He could have said no and just let the hostage takers keep the princess or murder her or whatever. It would have been the wrong choice. We would have blamed him for making that choice, but he still did have options in the situation. And as embarrassing a position as the prime minister was put in, we would probably say that he did the right thing under very difficult circumstances. Aristotle's point is that we can't praise him unless we call the action voluntary in some sense. And we could not have blamed him for doing the wrong thing if he had refused and just let the princess die. Unless we say that he did have some choice in the situation, making the action to some degree voluntary. Aristotle's second example is not so vivid. He imagined someone throwing a ship's cargo overboard in the storm in order to save himself and the others with him on the ship. Aristotle barely mentions this example in passing, but I think it can be really helpful for us to explore it in some detail in order to understand what he's up to in these cases of psychological force as opposed to physical force. In this example, we have the captain of a ship. She's in port A 
where a business person entrusts her with some valuable merchandise. The captain signs a contract to take the merchandise to point B to port B. The captain and her crew sail away toward port B, but on the way, they run into a storm. Aristotle's example requires us to think that the captain didn't know she was sailing into a storm. It came up suddenly without warning. The waves are so high, the boat is about to sink. It becomes clear to the captain that the only way to save the ship, and more importantly, to save the crew and her own life, is to throw the cargo overboard. I want you to notice the most important features of the story, along with the hostage-taking story. The first characteristic of both of these stories is that we didn't get ourselves into the situation knowingly or deliberately. It happened to us against our will. That's the involuntary part of it. Second, in the situation, our options are tragically limited. There's also an involuntary effect here. We have no good option. We're in a position of having to choose what I call in bad English, the least worst option. And the third characteristic is that certain actions that are normally bad become good in the situation and certain actions that are normally good become bad. In technical philosophy jargon, the moral valence of those actions changes. So in the case of the ship in a storm, it would normally be right for the captain to fulfill her contract to carry merchandise from port A to port B. But it would have been wrong in this situation. And it's normally very bad to destroy someone else's valuable property. But here, it becomes a good action. So Aristotle looks at situations like this, where the issue is psychological force, and he does not want to classify them as involuntary, because that would mean we could not praise the captain for what she did or blame her if she had done the opposite. And yet, Aristotle wants to take into account that these situations do have an aspect of involuntariness to them that puts them in a special class. He sees them as more voluntary than involuntary, although both elements are present. So he names, he classifies this sort of action, voluntary in a qualified way. Some of you have chosen to write about articles where the decision maker is facing a situation where even though it doesn't involve hostages or ships or storms, it still has these three features. So what Aristotle says here could really be relevant. But more importantly, you're probably all going to face some situations like this, possibly at several points in your own life. And I think what Aristotle has to say about them can be really helpful. Some people talk about making moral compromises in situations like this. But Aristotle wants to say, no, that's not a moral compromise. A virtuous person knows what to do in a situation like this, and they do the right thing, even when someone who doesn't know the circumstances might see it as a wrong thing. For Aristotle, again, it's not any kind of compromise. It's just a virtuous choice. For the next video, it will help you to have this handout in front of you titled Aristotle's Virtues and devices.